cool. You just gave me a really good idea. But... Yeah. <laughs> I chose that Minecraft Dungeons. I've been playing that a lot with my kids. So really? it kind of goes well with my shirt too. <laughs> Alrighty, it's just right at the top of the hour. I believe I can get started now. All right, welcome um, to this session. Uh, in case you're wondering um, what's happening, uh, am I going to give a talk about Minecraft Dungeons? Not quite. It's just so happened that I play a lot of that with my kids. I thought it'll be a cool background. Um, so this session is indeed about Azure reliability and resilience. Uh, and it's really a partnership right, between um, Microsoft as well as our good customers. Uh, let me introduce myself. First and foremost, my name is Fai. I'm a senior customer reliability engineer. Uh, there's, there's a lot of acronyms there. There's Azure CXP, which is customer experience. So CRE or customer reliability engineering is, um, is a team within CXP. So we work really closely with customers across all of their reliability and resilience uh, needs uh, of their work, workloads on Azure, uh, but we also play a role within the team. Uh, different people play different uh, roles. Uh, myself, I, I, I'm an Azure communications manager as well. I go on rotation uh, every few weeks um, to communicate um, any incidents that happens on the platform. Uh, but this also gives me a really good perspective about you know, what could potentially happen and how do we work closely with our customers to ensure that uh, when failures do happen, how you know, or, or how to get into proactive before that that happens, right? Um, so, in, in a nutshell, that that's what we do. Um, and since this talk is about reliability and resilience, uh, so I'm thinking there has to be a bit of high availability here. So, I'm just not gonna be the only person uh, in this talk. Uh, that's why I've invited um, my teammate Ramia to join us, uh, so that in case anything happens, uh, Ramia could pretty much take over and, and present uh, the rest of the slides in the deck, right? So we were thought about reliability and resilience, not just in, in the cloud, but also across what we do. Uh, um, so Ramya, over to you. Uh, uh, introduction of yourself, please. Thanks, Fai. Uh, thanks everyone for joining this session today. Um, like Fai mentioned, we are part of a team called Azure Customer Reliability Engineering which is essentially a kind of a customer outreach uh, program where we work very closely with our customers to ensure that their workloads are extremely stable on our platform. Uh, we also take feedback from our customers. If something's not working, something needs improvement, uh, we take that back to the product group and we work with them to ensure that the platform reliability is improved. So essentially, this is more like um, uh, a conduit between the product group and the and our customers, which is which is essentially our day job. Um, with that, I think I'll hand it over to Fai, and we can uh, you know start the session. All right, perfect. Um, Thank so you. Uh, if you've got any questions at all, uh, Ramya has kindly volunteered to help out in answering all of the tough questions. So uh, my job is made a lot easier by just presenting the deck. Um, so <laughs> trust that Ramya will, will be um, able to get you answers that you need as when we go through the session. So feel free to ask questions anytime during this talk. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. Uh, I'm just going to turn off my camera um, so that we'll dive right straight in.
Alrighty, so this is the agenda. Um, first, I'll talk about what are reliable applications and why is that really a partnership between the cloud vendor, Microsoft in this, uh, in this equation, as well as yourself. Um, then I'll talk about some of those concepts and ideas that may be new to you or maybe something that you're really familiar with, but nevertheless, it will be a good refresher to kind of understand how do we approach reliability and resilience uh, on any cloud workloads. Then we'll dive into what are some of the initiatives against some because there are heaps of initiatives within Azure Engineering Group itself. Uh, we'll cover some of the, the most notable initiatives from, from Azure. Uh, then we'll talk about your accountability as well as what are the things that you should consider um, to build resiliency and reliability into your applications itself, uh, even before you deploy that um, a single line of code onto the cloud. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, Q&A doesn't just have to happen at the end of it. Um, at any given time, if you've got any question at all, please feel free to just type on, on that chat window. Um, Nadia, our, our producer of this event, uh, would, would gladly uh, moderate that and also Ramia would be on point to answer some, some, some questions as well. So uh, let's start with a definition. Right? What are reliable applications? Um, I've highlighted a few things there. Um, it's about application which are resilient from failures because failures do happen. Um, and it's not just about the, the, the inherent nature of the cloud, uh, but it's to be expected across anything. Um, so the, the key word here is like how do you recover gracefully or rather those applications that you built, how do you make sure that that recover gracefully um, with minimal downtime and also minimal data loss? Right? Uh, um, so when you build an architecture, um, you build it with two things, three things in mind, actually. You want to make them highly available. Um, you need to have a plan for disaster recovery. Uh, and often with your DR plan comes um, a really good um, backup procedures to resolve any potential data loss. Um, so understanding how all these elements work together and how they affect costs, because that is really essential to building a reliable application. Later on, we'll talk about some of those trade-offs. It doesn't mean that all of these things comes without costs, and you need to really consider uh, what are the trade-offs, uh, trade right? Uh, whether it's cost, whether it's reliability, or whether that's performance. Um, so real good things for you to, to consider as when we go on deeper into these topics. And as the topic of this session is called, is, is really about a partnership. So it's a partnership between Azure um, and coming from, from an engineering perspective, uh, we are accountable for delivering a resilient and reliable platform. Uh, but we also want to work closely, fortunately for Rami and myself, we work in a team that has really good close um, working relationship with a lot of uh, customers, including good startups. Um, so we, work with them in understanding what those reliability requirements are, uh, as well as like a really good point that Ramay mentioned earlier about capturing signals and, and feeding that back into the quality initiatives from across multiple engineering teams in, in, in Azure. Um, as, as good Azure customers of yourself, you are, you are accountable for building reliability into your application, and this goes across everything, right? From from the design, the code, as well as uh, your applications. Um, one thing to really take note of is that for customers, it's important to consider all of the dependencies, the applications that you're building, as well as the services on which you are dependent upon and, and how those applications are designed and operated. So not just looking at the, the, the design perspective of it, but also understanding how it is to be operated. Uh, so typically we cover uh, that goes into the realms of DevOps, um, you know, that that's where, you know, um, SRE, one of the principles is, is about really looking into how cloud systems are operated efficiently. Now, building systems um, is a shared responsibility. Now, we build and operate the foundation, as, as you know, um, and you being a customer, you choose what are the relevant services that would help uh, with your resilience needs. Um, and then your, your applications effectively sit on top of that. Now it's important to understand that all this stacks up on, on top of each other because that is how you figure out whose responsibility it is. 
So Microsoft's um, responsibility is in providing that resilient foundation, and we make consider considerable investment uh, in the platform itself. Um, and this will be a focus of the rest of this presentation. Um, you know, when, when, and by this, we mean physical things like our data centers, as well as the software that goes across um, all of those data centers. Um, and, and when we look at that, we'll, we'll also be able to kind of delve more into what are the deployment and maintenance uh, processes that, that we do. Um, and all these resilient services that you can pick and choose from, uh, although it's not operated by customer, but uh, it's very much done in a way that customers, when when you build or when you deploy your workloads across uh, onto the cloud, you need to understand what are your high availability, your disaster recovery plans, um, so that all those comes within your reliability requirements. All that has to be defined um, really clearly from uh, from the start. Um, and I'm sure you, you're really familiar with this, right? The differences between um, all of the different models in the cloud, starting all the way from, you know, traditionally you may be coming from an on-premises world, then you move to IaaS, pass as, as well as SAS, right? Um, the, the, the key here is really, uh, again, understanding, um, you know, what are the things that you are expected to run and what are the things that you would expect from your cloud provider? Um, I'm not gonna delve too much into this slide, but moving on uh, is to understand more about how, as when we approach reliability and resilience, what are the things we need to consider? Now, this is a really nice diagram that talks about reliability from two standpoints. At the very top of that is um, compute. Now, as much as you build applications that, that leverages platform as a service, so you could be using app services or whatnot, but under the hood, there are still compute and storage. So if you look at reliability um, across those two core components in any cloud application, um, you, you want to understand, OK, um, the compute layers underneath. What sort of reliability metrics am I looking at? So if you take a look at a single VM, you're looking at three nines. That is by using single VM with premium and ultra disk, so you get three nines. Um, if you look at a uh, higher SLA with local redundancy, what are you looking at, right? Three nines and a half, and by so, that means you need, absolutely need to have more than two instances of VMs, uh, and you will be leveraging availability sets uh, with all the goodness um, with fault domains and update domains, and that kind of protects your application to a certain extent, right? And then you, you continue going this by leveraging um, um, other features like availability zones where in regions that is supported. Um, and, and, and most recently in Australia East, uh, availability zone has been lighted up. I've tested that myself. Um, you can absolutely deploy uh, a VMSS or a, or a VM scale set across um, multiple three availability zones as um, to be precise, right, across um, the region. And with that, you get four nines of, of SLA. And if you take a look at um, storage options, you, you move anything from LRS to LRS with managed disk, going to zone redundant storage. And obviously, if you if you go with the industry leading RPO and RTO by, by leveraging um, a service called Azure Site Recovery, that gives you even higher SLAs. So resiliency in Azure is really a comprehensive set of um, business continuity solutions. Uh, it's all built in within it. It provides high availability, disaster recovery, backup, um, so as to protect your mission critical applications. Um, so no matter what your requirements are, we can help your organization to achieve that. But you have to design and operate those mission critical workloads uh, by taking advantage of those built in features um, and, and really understanding what those are all about. Now, the same um, diagram that you see here is available on our reliability side. Uh, there is a link to that at the end of my slide deck. Um, it's, all, it's all shortened, so you should be able to, to get hold of that later. Now, this is just a slide to show what are the potential cumulative downtime, right? Now, the, the slide that I painted above talks a lot about the SLA of each service, right? Whether if you're looking at compute or storage, uh, this is what it means, right? Now, I'm sure this is no surprise. Uh, it's not new information to you, but nevertheless, it's, it's a good refresher or reminder of what all those nines mean um, in 
potential cumulative downtime. Like for instance, deploying uh, a single VM gives you three nines, right? So what that means is that potential cumulative downtime in, in, um, in a month would be for the three minutes. But if you look at that um, for across an entire year, that may well be a full business day, right? Eight eight point seven six hours. Just something to keep in the back of your mind what those means. Um, but when it comes to reliability and resi resilience, um, this is a question that backs. That's all that's perfect, right? We're tell telling you that all those nines means higher reliability and resilience. So shouldn't that be something that you that that is inherent across the workloads or the solutions that you built on top of Azure? And then do you just subsequently just pass it on to the customers? Now with this slide, you, you might think that okay, where am I leading with this? The the answer is actually no. Um, and let, let's do some some maths um, to to really understand what those SLAs actually break down, or what does it actually mean to you when you're building your applications on top of all these services which they are dependent upon um, in in Azure. So composite SLA uh, looks across all of those SLAs of the different service offerings and it is the result of com combining those SLAs. Uh, as you can see from the slide here, uh, the resulting SLA can provide a higher or lower uptime value depending on your application architecture. So this slide explains how you um, calculate um, the composite SLA. Uh, it is no surprise that, an, that an application relies on multiple services, has lower composite SLA because it has more potential failure points. So if you take a look at this, um, uh, a typical really simple application across three tiers uh, leverages app services, um, Azure SQL databases, as well as storage blobs. Now, each one of these has its own uh, published SLAs, and you can get that from the Azure uh, documentation um, site. You take each one of those, uh, depending on the actual SKU of the service offering that, that you're leveraging in Azure, you multiply each one of them, and the composite SLA um, no surprise that is actually a lot lower. So in this case, your application um, SLO to your end users, to your business users, if you're just leveraging those services in Azure, turns out to be a uh, way lower. So it's just two nines, 99.84. Um, so let's pause here at a moment to, to understand that this is no fault of anyone, but if you just build your application and you think that well, since Azure is providing me those SLAs, I'll just pass it down to my customers or to my end users. Um, that's not quite the way that you do it because you need to understand the con concept of composite SLA. Now, is this all bad news? <laughs> uh, not necessarily, right? So understanding this means that there are means in which you could actually improve the composite SLA of your workload in the cloud. So how do you define this? Um, now, I've alluded to this at the beginning. You need to understand your availability or your reliability requirements. Now, oftentimes I get into conversation with um, customers and they they do have some of this being outlined, but understanding the availability requirements is really an exercise that transcends across multiple facets um, and, and a really good way to help our customers define resilience requirements is by asking these questions. And typically these are the sort of questions that we do ask in resilience workshops. Uh, for instance, asking how much downtime is acceptable, right? Um, the duration of data loss. Um, so all this is actually really going on to understanding important metrics uh, such as uh, recovery time objective as well as uh, recovery point objective. Um, so these are the things to, to ask. And then it's also crucial to understand that you know how much money and time will your business realistically invest? Uh, it, it's a really difficult question to 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 answer at times, but nevertheless, it's something that is important, right? Because if, if you have all the money and time in the world, obviously you could build um, plenty of redundancy into your application, um, and everything will be all well, right? But and the 
in the ideal world and in in, in realistically, that is often not the case. So based upon what you've defined, that's where you need to figure out what are your trade offs uh, and two very important metrics for you to understand. So when it comes to building your application, it's no longer about SLA. SLA is what the cloud provider provides to you. Uh, in fact, SLAs are financially backed. Um, to put it simply, um, when you truly could talk to Azure about SLA is it's not really a good discussion to have because all, all that is all there is to, it, to that discussion is about because it's a financially backed SLA is about getting credits, um, Azure credits to be to be to be provided to you. But something has really happened, right? You have experienced downtime. So rather the discussion to have or the things to consider when you're designing your application to, uh, is, to, is to identify what is your target level of reliability? And that metric is called service level objective. So really important point here is when it, when it comes to designing your own workloads, it's no longer about SLAs. Obviously, SLAs will help you um, calculate that, like, like what I presented in the earlier slides about composite SLAs, but your accountability to your end users or to your customers is all captured in this metric called SLO or service level objective. Now to measure this would be a bunch of uh, underlying metrics uh, and there are service level indicators. So these indicators would, would define how do you reach your reliability target as well as how do you measure it. So if you've got instrumentation, monitoring and alerts all built in into your cloud workloads, those will report your uh, metrics for your service level indicators. And all that actually rolls back up to your service level objective. So that's how, um, in, in a nutshell, how you would define your your availability requirements. Now, how do we improve the composite SLAs? Uh, so previously, I, I might I might have painted uh, a green picture about yeah, when when you leverage multiple services, the composite SLA is actually a lot lower than than you know each one of those dependent services that you leverage uh, on, on Azure. But you, there are things you could do. Um, so you can improve composite SLA by creating independent fallback paths. And what I really mean by this is um, like, for example, in this architecture diagram, it leverages an active active um, deployment across multiple regions, not just multiple regions, but you are actually using the concept of region pairing. So using Australia East as well as Australia Southeast. Uh, you might might see a bit of bias in, in this particular talk. We, we, we mentioned a lot about Australia because both Rami and myself are actually based in Sydney. Uh, you might have actually you know, um, sign up for this event through the Microsoft Reactor Sydney. Um, so that's why we use a lot of examples in, in Australia. Um, but it, uh, going back to this topic, how do I improve uh, composite SLA since I have that set up? This is how I would calculate, uh, not how I would calculate it, but, but rather how composite SLAs are calculated. So first you, you figure out what is the composite unavailability across those two regions. Uh, now, so previously, this this actually uses uh, the slide that I had. Now, previously, I um, for, for a particular region, my composite SLA is ninety nine point eight four. Right, so the unavailability for each region is zero point one six. Right, uh, you multiply that, and basically you get um, less than a zero point zero two five six percent unavailability. Um, so when you consider um, what is the composite SLA when I have these two active regions, um, deployments that's being spread across this, um, this is this is what it looks like. So now all of a sudden I have three nines, much better than what I had previously, which was just two nines, right, 99.84. Um, and coupled with traffic manager, the ability for me to load balance traffic across those two regions and looking at SLA that traffic manager itself provides, which are four nines of SLA, uh, you multiply that, now you're, you're getting something that is a lot more um, nicer, I would say, um, 99.96, right, three nines, and a half. Uh, so effectively, this is how you could improve composite SLA uh, just based upon a very simple architecture here. Uh, how else could you achieve um, um, high availability? Uh, here are some other concepts. I've, I've talked a bit about this. 
Um, another thing you could leverage would be um, availability zone because you don't just need to consider deploying across multiple regions, but within a single region itself, if it supports availability zone, like I mentioned in Australia East, you can leverage that. Uh, and with that, that spreads um, your deployment across multiple data centers, which are separated in terms of power, cooling, and networking. Um, and typically when you start deploying services, there's two very important concepts to, to understand about availability zone. You could either make um, your deployments zonal. So in other words, you deploy this with full understanding that those resources will be spread across um, the, the three availability zones to, in order to achieve quorum um, in a particular region. Um, or you could leverage some services which are zone, sorry, uh, services which are zone redundant um, inherently. Uh, so those are two important concepts, zonal as well as zone redundant. Um, and when you when you deploy that, you have multiple options as well. Like those are some of the options which I've put on the slide. Um, region pairing is important as well because when we deploy services according to the safe deployment practice, I'll talk a little bit about um, that SDP in short uh, in one of my later slides. But when we deploy that as well as when we recover services, um, they are actually prioritized across regions. And when it comes to Azure regions, um, that's, 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 that's the differentiation between what is a hub as well as what is a, um, a hero region as well. Um, and this goes the same with um, system updates that that we roll out. Again, more details of that when I talk about SDP or safe deployment practices. Uh, and then you also need to think about not just about compute, but you know data. What are your data replication or consistency consideration of like databases as well as things that you put into storage. Now, if there is a customer reported issue. Um, and you, if you have alerts all set up within, you know, based upon what you're monitoring and the instrumentation that you put into your application, the question that backs is, is it Azure or is it me? Right? Um, and, and rightfully so, right? Because it could, it may well be anyone. Um, at, the, at the beginning of this um, talk, I say failures do happen, right? So it, when it does happen, um, how do you know who caused that? The, the reason is not about finger pointing, but it's really to understand what is the root cause of the issue. And also it, it, it shapes what are your fail over as well as when to fail back. Um, so there's a lot of implications um, behind this question. So where should you start? Um, um, you may be familiar with um, observability, right? Uh, concepts of what do you observe um, in any applications that that that's been deployed in the cloud? Um, the first thing that you that 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 you can see at the very top is you want to focus your observability um, on your end users because that explains the entire user journey. And and when there is a customer reported issue, it's often an end, end user telling you that something is not working. So if you are observing the same patterns as what your end users or your customers are experiencing, you, you're on, 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 the, on, on the right track here, right? Now, historically, we've always focused most of our monitoring efforts on the health and, and the status of the resources at the, at the very technical component layer, right? Like looking across the web instances, you know, were CPU spiking, were this almost full, are available memory low. Now, all those things are still things that, that you need to, to monitor, but in the cloud, though, we now care a bit less about those traditional metrics because we need to, mon while we need to monitor them, Automation can also be put in place to, to increase capacity so that you can scale out, you, know, uh, you can add additional resources, and not just scaling um, in a, a, a particular deployment, you can also scale that geographically across multiple regions. So the concerns and, and the appropriate response here is that you, you need to embrace cloud and uh, its automation capabilities. So going back to what I, I've said earlier, we need to be able to focus on monitoring efforts uh, with greater observability closer to the end user. Um, so uh, for instance, you'll be looking at exactly the metrics of what customers will be seeing, right? Um, um, yeah, there, there are really good articles on, on Azure document, 
as a documentation that, that talks about, you know, how should you observe a web application, for instance. Um, so it's not to say that you don't need to care about the actual technical implementation details. You still need to have all those things being monitored and have good alerting and, and use autom automation wherever possible. But what I'm saying is that in order to figure out if there was a customer reported issue, is it me or is it Azure? It, it all comes back down to where your observability focuses, right? And it should always be um, laser focus on, on your end users. Now this slide talks about what is the goal of an observable system. It's really to, to reflect the entire reality of your system, right? Um, and these are some of the um, metrics that you, you look into. All this forms your service level indicators, right? How many requests came to the server, errors that came to the server, um, as well as what are your policies or um, things that you put in place um, for your error threshold, not just for error threshold, but say you've got an API gateway, you know, what is the threshold in there before you start throttling uh, the request that comes in. Um, so you would still log all those information, you would aggregate that, um, but when you start monitoring from the service side, what you want to do is get that entire full picture. And the entire full picture is not something that you can get just by looking at individual matrices. You, you need to again go back to what are the final service level objective, which kind of maps to the observability focus that was really hopping on uh, in that previous slide. So I'm going to shift gear. Um, since we have approached multiple concepts um, across reliability and resilience, what are the initiatives um, across Azure? Now here are a sample of the quality initiatives that we currently have underway in Azure. Uh, there's quite a number of them. Now again, these are very high level initiatives that's driven across every component team. And when, when I talk about component team, that means every engineering team within Azure that is responsible for engineering, um, uh, responsible for, for product development of those Azure services. Now, each one of them are pivotal part of, of this process. Um, and Azure engineering um, adopts a semester planning process as well as a development process. Um, so all of this is actually built in into it. But each one of this really help us improve specific sets, sets of metrics. Going back to what Ramya was, was talking about initially, that you know we do get a feedback and signals from customers to provide this to those Azure component teams so that they can build this into um, their own quality initiatives. Right? Let's go a bit deeper into one of them. Um, and this was what I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is um, the safe deployment practices. Um, if you've uh, subscribed to our service health alerts, we typically talk about this uh, within the advisory that we sent out, if not the actual root cause analysis, the RCA, that explains um, why certain decisions were made uh, or, or why it took considerable time um, before um, having something land across um, the cloud, right? Uh, and it, it really starts in test and development and moving into all those stages. Um, you may have seen uh, um, a term called EUAP. Uh, that, that's, that basically stands for Early User Access Program. Some people call it Canary. Um, you, you can find certain regions in Azure that has that label into it, like Central U US EUAP. Now, some of our customers, not just first party services within Microsoft that are deployed there, uh, but customers also deploy some of their workloads across that because they also want, want to understand what is the impact or could there be a potential impact of any of the new features features uh, that are being rolled out before it actually affects or before it could potentially impact um, the production workload. So quite a number of, of customers do have deployments across our EUAP regions as well. Now each one of this is, is, is actually a, a gradual um, step across 
multiple stages, right? Uh, as we move through, you might find that we go through hardware pilot checks for any incompatibility issues because there are different hardware generations across our data centers. Uh, if you've seen one of those talks by Mark Resinovich, uh, the CTO of Azure, you would have seen him talking about you know, some of the different hardware generations. Uh, so across our fleet, which is, you know, different hardware that we have deployed across our entire, I think what, 60 different uh, regions across Azure. Um, there are different hardware, so we want to make sure that it goes through that vast array, array of different hardware um, and, and, and pilot that so that at least we get the first slice of whatever features that we're deploying could be tested um, against ourselves first and foremost. Now things are also allowed uh, its own respective big times, if you will. So. Each one of this is it doesn't it doesn't proceed until it's completely big, right? Because we want to know what are the effects of it once we've deployed that across um, that production rollout pipeline. Um, and we we often look at this. Um, we we'll even change the velocity of those releases based upon you know what's the success or trends that we look at because everything is, is being instrumented, everything is being monitored across Azure. So there will be multiple teams that's actually looking at that before it goes on, right? So uh, all in all, in this slide is is to really explain um, you know the the sort of rigor that's being put into rolling out a release across. Um, Azure. So the same thing goes with um, number one, having multiple toll gates to ensure quality is being well defined. Uh, but at times, um, what this means is also like, for instance, if, if there is a feature improvement or if there is a, a repair item that needs to be deployed, it also has to go through that same process itself, right? So um, now um, I, I do have questions from, from customers who might work with who says that, hey, you know what? That repair that repair item that you you've told me that would actually fix the issue that I've experienced. You know why can't that be deployed? You know immediately. That the reason why it would also take time to 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 be deployed um, across a broad rollout is also because we want to make sure that you know any any quality checks are caught early on rather than later, right? Because as you can see. Uh, if we get closer and closer to a broad rollout, all right, it actually increases cost and the impact of failures. It all goes down to how um, we choose what regions we, we tr try this out. Like for instance, we would absolutely try this out in a in a hot region and not in a hero region, right? Because the potential blast radius is a lot larger in a hero region compared to a smaller hub region. So those are all the things that we we take into consideration um, across that safe deployment practice. So Failures do happen, right? Um, and a lot of this has to do with, um, you know, changes that happens in the cloud. Uh, comparing any cloud providers and on-premises um, systems is that uh, there, there are less changes that happen in the on-prem world versus the cloud world, right? So there's ongoing, any given time, there, there, there are heaps of maintenance that, that goes on. Uh, again, customers have asked me this question before. Is like, can you tell me exactly what are the maintenance that are running across my virtual machines right at this moment? Um, and I can't even tell. Like, even if I were to pull one of uh, my engineering colleagues, uh, a principal or a distinguished engineer, none of them would know. The reason is because like a lot of this are being automated, like based upon what you've you've um, learned in the previous slide. Um, but any given time, there are heaps of things that 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 goes in to either patch the, the host OS, uh, there'll be feature updates, there'll be security updates, anything could actually happen at a given time. So what's more important is like, how do we minimize that impact of each and every one of this ongoing maintenance? Because um, you still certainly understand the benefits that we get out of this, right? Because, uh, you know, in the public cloud, you get the latest and greatest. Um, but the side effect of that, that could be potential impact. Um, and to understand the potential impact, it's important to, for you to understand um, those different categories of maintenance events uh, that could go out. So there could be planned, unplanned, 
uh, when, when things do happen, you know, what do we do? Um, so two strategies that we use, uh, they're, all, they're, they're both quality initiative as well, having in place upgrade uh, as well as live migration. So Microsoft Research and a lot of our engineering teams spend significant uh, amount of effort in building all these effective and scalable mechanisms um, to minimize downtime for customers. Uh, we also use machine learning and automation to, uh, to heavily um, go through a, a number of scenarios to better uh, detect and, and respond to issues that, that do occur. Um, so, um, so a lot of this are self-learning, they're proactive, um, and that there's, there's intelligence or augmentation to it. Uh, for example, I can speak from experience being in, on, in, in, in the role of an Azure communications manager. Uh, a number of um, Azure communication service health alerts are actually automated, uh, as in there's no human intervention. If we do de detect certain signals, um, as a customer, you would receive an advisory. Obviously, we do have people on, 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 on rotation to, to ensure that once we get more details about what that particular outage or incident is all about, then we, we do build up on top of that and, and update the communication that goes out. Um, so that there's a whole bunch of things uh, being automated, but we also have human um, um, to, to kind of step in to, to provide more information when needed. Um, so information related to plant maintenance um, are available. Um, uh, for any service that is, uh, in this particular example, is to understand uh, plant maintenance that could happen for virtual machines, uh, uh, specifically to, to VMs that are impacted by it. And so how we communicate is based upon subscription. So at any given time, we understand there is a plant maintenance that is going to go on to this particular cluster of uh, VMs in the data center. We are able to find out who are all the customers by their subscription IDs, who could be potentially impacted by it. Um, so you, you would see this first and foremost in your service health uh, alert um, blade within your Azure portal. Uh, but you could also uh, do this from a number of different means as well. Like for instance, uh, the first part here talks about how you could actually get system notification by um, uh, listening to um, an, an endpoint which, which exposes a, a REST API. So you have full uh, visibility about what's happening, um, not just across the VMs, but across cloud services, uh, AV sets, as well as VMSS. Um, now, some questions that you may have is like, um, you know, what does this mean, right? When there's a plant maintenance event. Number one, your virtual machine may be rebooted. Um, your, your next question would be why? Why do we reboot your virtual machine? <laughs> now, while the majority of updates and upgrades to the Azure platform do not impact virtual machines availability, uh, like for instance, what I've mentioned earlier uh, about um, live migration. So there would just be a short blip in which um, that's like a short network brownout um, when your, your machines are being live migrated. But in most cases, um, you, you don't see anything. In cases that we, we, we can't do that, that is when we would have to reboot that virtual machine. Um, and we have accumulated several changes that requires um, uh, that to restart our service that, that may result in virtual machines reboot. Um, so it's very important to, to um, again, go back to your reliability targets as well as understanding what are your options for uh, designing for high availability. Um, so when you have that, that means that you will start thinking that, all right, fine, my, my VM could be rebooted in, in the worst case scenario, but because I'm leveraging availability set or machine uh, VM scale sets, or I'm I actually have, um, redundant compute of VM across multiple zones within availability zones, then my chance of having any impact from a particular uh, VM reboot event is actually a lot lesser. So it goes back to really understanding now when there is an outage uh, or if there is a plant maintenance event, there is a blast radius, so as to speak, right? Um, and your consideration is very much how do you limit the impact of that particular of 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 that event um, to your services. Um, here's a case study for uh, what do you, do we do as well? So it's not just about having monitoring and alerts, 
But on top of that, there's also a lot of machine learning um, AI models that we deploy across our fleet uh, to ensure there's higher availability. Um, this particular um, study uh, is a case study which has been published uh, by our Microsoft researchers at uh, the use, use NICS ATC 2018. And, and this paper, what our researchers have proposed is um, to predict errors proactively before they cause more severe damage to the cloud system. Uh, so uh, when there are these errors, it's not just something that impacts your storage accounts. Uh, it, it would actually Im impact the virtual machines in which your managed disks are, are mapped onto, right? So what you want to do is to more proactively predict if there's going to be a disk um, error. So the ability to predict faulty disks enables live migration of those virtual machines which are impacted um, and then allocate new virtu virtual machines on healthy disks, right? Before you, as a, as a customer, you wouldn't realize that, oh yeah, that was an underlying fault in one of the, um, the disks within my managed disk, right? For instance. Now, while this started as a paper, this is absolutely in um, in production, uh, so we are indeed using uh, this in, in predicting that and, and live migration of those VMs actually happens um, automatically as well. Here's another interesting um, uh, quality initiative within Azure is codenamed Project Tardigrade. Um, so this effort draws its inspiration uh, from this, what you see in the diagram here, an eight-legged microscopic creature uh, is called the Tardigrade. Uh, it's also known as the water bear. So uh, the water bear is virtually impossible to kill. Um, um, not that I know this personally, but <laughs> uh, um, according to research, tidy grays can be exposed to extreme conditions, but somehow still manage to, to wiggle their way to survival. And that's exactly what we envision our service to emulate when we consider resiliency. So hence, we, we call this project tidy great. Uh, so similar to this, what we want to do is to build resiliency and self-healing mechanisms across multiple layers of the platform, ranging from the hardware to software, like even networking is all software defined. So it's not just over uh, physical links, but across you know, the software part of it as well, uh, all with a view of safeguarding um, the resources um, and, and, and most in particular virtual machines um, so that if there's any impact at all, you know, customers would not um, you know, experience those impact as much. Um, here's a link um, to a video in which Mark Rysinovich talks more about Project Tardigrade. He, he actually did a demonstration of that within our, our, our research demo environments as well. So do take a look at that um, and definitely Mark will be doing a way better job in, 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 in explaining what this quality initiative is all about. Um, I've spoken about this before, a little bit alluding to like when we send service health alerts. Now, the important um, key takeaway here is that you should configure service health alerts. If there's anything else that you got from my um, presentation is like you should always sign up for service health alerts. Now, the service health alerts is available through a service health blade within your Azure portal. Um, now, setting this up, um, the, the right way to do this is not just to look at that, but also to set up action groups in which you can get automatic notifications of any issues, maintenance, outages, whatever it is through your, your preferred channels. Um, you can sign up for emails, SMS, and if you've got a bit of your DevOps practices all set up, um, you can even have webhook integration with ServiceNow, PagerDuty, or OpsGenie. Um, now, a lot of our customers are also familiar with status.azure.com. Now, this is only used to communicate issues with uh, widespread impact. So the, the way to, to consider this is that um, if there is anything that is brought, right, something that we are not able to communicate based upon the subscriptions which are impacted by it, it pops up on status.azure.com. Or when there is a widespread Right, widespread outage that spans across um, a particular region or multiple regions. This is where you would go to. So consider status.azure.com uh, like a um, a pulse check, 
right, to see what's happening across Azure. So we certainly get a lot from customers saying that, hey, you know what, I'm pretty sure this is an, an Azure outage, but I didn't see anything on status.azure.com. Um, and the reason for that is because it did not actually, um, it, it is basically an outage. If we can communicate it directly to your subscription, you should absolutely, the first place to go check is the service health blade within your Azure portal, because that would give you all that information. Uh, something that, that, that pops up on status.azure.com is usually something that is uh, of, of a larger impact to a large number of customers as such it is it, it can be found there. So this is what, um, uh, this is not exactly what's happening now, but um, uh, within the Azure status page, uh, there is a history and within the history, it's not just uh, about communication that we've sent out, but also uh, when we publish RCAs or root cause analysis, they're all being captured there. And a lot of this are you know, pretty detailed. Now again, the same thing um, you would expect from within the service health blade and on your Azure portal, you could also request um, any incidents that are impacting your subscription and you could specifically request for a public RCA and we would deliver one to you within a uh, seven day uh, SLA. So this is what that service health notification actually looked like. Um, um, first, first and foremost, you would you would basically take a look at this within the service health blade within your Azure portal. Uh, and we also differentiate the different type of events such as you know, service issues, plant maintenance, so on and so forth. Uh, if you set up an action group, uh, in this case, I've set up an action group that sends me an email when there is a um, um, an event that impacted that impacted the resources that I'm using in Azure um, and as such I'll, I'll get one of those emails in this case this is an RCA for uh, an issue that impacted Azure files customers uh, along with what's the root cause and, and, and mitigation as well um, just to make sure that everyone is on point where this is so this is my Azure portal um, and don't be alarmed by all these services that you're seeing. Again, this is an engineering subscription. So uh, this is what we call a global subscription. So I have a full view of what's happening across all regions. Um, so this is, these are events that's happening as it is now, um, and you can actually find more information to it. But like I said, um, the, the right way to do this is actually to go to Health Alerts, create an action group, and subscribe to those events. Um, and if you like, you could request for um, a public RCA um, by, by just clicking on this link over here. So having said that, so what's, what's your responsibility uh, and also consideration for improving reliability and resilience in your workload? First thing is to take a look at the, the, the uh, the, the recently announced um, Azure Well Architect, uh, Architected Framework. Um, and this has a bunch of good guidance and best practices uh, across five uh, pillars. Um, so cost optimization is about um, helping you understand how to manage costs and maximize the value being delivered. Because like I mentioned, resiliency has a lot to do with cost as well. Like if, if you want the most reliable and, and resilient, redundant um, architecture, it, it costs uh, a lot to that. Um, so you need to understand how you could actually uh, manage your cost to maximize the value that you're actually getting out of it as well. Um, Reliability uh, is not just about the architecture itself, but it's about you know having operation processes that keep your system running um, across your production life cycles. Um, then you need to take a look at the performance efficiency, which is very much the ability of the system to adapt to changes in load. And how do you react to that? Like when do you trigger a scale out operation? Um, then uh, a specific topic, in reliability itself, which is the ability of a system to recover from failures and being able to continue to function as well. Uh, and very importantly, uh, security in, in terms of how do you protect your applications as well as your data from, from threats as well. So I mentioned trade-offs a, a number of times, right? Um, so th there is a distinction, right, between different workloads, right? DevTaf, Dev test workloads as well as mission critical workloads. Um, so what you want to do is that you want to focus on 
like for instance, the strategies that you use for your mission critical workloads is that you will want to justify a higher cost or, or rather you would be able to justify a higher cost of a highly available architecture uh, to protect against a much, much lower downtime, right? And going back to uh, the things which I mentioned before, really understanding the SLAs of different services in which your workloads are dependent upon, but beyond that, uh, in, in case when failures do happen, what is your uh, RTO as well as RPO targets, because all of this actually lead to uh, expensive design choices as well, right? Um, but really understanding that means that you know you're able to justify the higher investment in case when it is a mission critical workload. So it is that inevitable that you do have to leverage HA as well as DR options, right? Um, and then um, obviously you gotta secure everything. So cost versus security, that, that the recommendation here is that increasing the security of workload would absolutely increase cost, but you know, as a general rule of thumb, um, please do not compromise on security. Um, this is the Azure Reliability slide that I was talking about. Uh, if you could just search for Azure Reliability, it brings you to this particular website that you can see the link. Um, uh, and within the Azure Well Architecture, sorry, uh, <laughs> Azure Well Architected Framework, there are um, three um, really good components of them. Uh, that does a review of where you're at. Um, so there are a bunch of questions that, that we ask and it helps you uh, understand what you've, you're currently doing, what you've employed, what you intend to do, what you're planning. Uh, it gives you a score at the end of it. Uh, obviously you can read more about that well-architected framework. Uh, there is also a learning path available with really short courses um, for you to understand um what are the important things across those five pillars that i've talked about so all in all is that we believe that you know what you're developing on azure with your 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 ip as well as the services that you've deployed plus you know not just the web architecture framework but across a number of um, uh, very deliberate uh, decisions that you make equals more success of whatever workloads that you have deployed and are running in the cloud so having said that, um, uh, with five minutes to go, um, good for some q and A. I'm not too sure if there were any questions that were that were being posed uh, throughout the talk, but let me take a look. I trust that um, Ramir have been busy with that. Sorry, we don't have any open questions on the uh, chat. But uh, we can still we still have another four minutes. Yep, perfect. Sure. So maybe while we do that, I might do a quick um, update on what's coming up at the Microsoft Reactor. And um, in that time, feel free to add some more Q and A's for Fight and Ramia to to answer. Um, does that work for you guys? Yeah, that sounds perfect. Awesome. Yep, sounds good. Awesome. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, please feel free to go ahead and put in your questions. Um, so if you want to know the events of Microsoft Reactor Sydney has running, you can find out at meetup.com slash Microsoft Reactor Sydney. Um, I will also post the link to the recording of the event in there in the next couple of days. You can also see our global events that we have by following us on Twitter. Um, any previous events as well, we do have the recording on our YouTube channel. If you do want to find out some more information about the reactor or any questions about some sessions we've run or you're keen to get involved as well, feel free to email us at reactorsit at microsoft.com. I thought I'd just take you through a couple of the events that we do have up and coming. Um, we do have a session on Azure DevOps API. So in this session, it'll show you how Azure API and service hooks enable integration of your own third party apps into Azure repo, repo pull requests lifecycle. Um, and this is going to provide some insights into code changes and add some value. We do have another hands on workshop called Build Quick and Easy AI Solutions Using Power Platform within an hour. 
So in an hour, you'll go through some solutions and steps to implement AI solutions using Power Apps and Power Virtual Agents. Um, and then another session we have is taking us into September, um, Flow in an Hour with Flow Ninja John Liu. So um, this is going to be an hour workshop to learn about Power Automate, which was previously named Microsoft Flow. Um, you'll learn to build approval workflow, learn about controls and patterns, and debug and resolve errors. So that's another hands-on workshop as well. Um, if you do have any questions or any feedback for this session, you can leave it at our link, which is aka.ms slash reactor slash survey, and I have popped that into the Q&A chat as well. Um, so I don't think there's been any other questions that have come through, so I might just wrap us up there, if, um, unless Fai, Ramia, you guys had any questions? No, this is all good. Um, thanks so much for everyone who is joining us. Um, so just to give you back two minutes to your busy day. Um, thanks for joining us in this session. Awesome. Thank you so much, Fine. Thank you so much, Ramia, for jumping in there and answering the questions. Um, we're getting some good feedback as well, people. Um, thank you for the session and that they really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you all for, um, for joining us today and I'll get that recording all uploaded for you. Thank you, Fai. Thank you, Ramia. And we'll speak soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nadia. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.